Okay, well, welcome everybody to the 10th SOFI seminar. I'm Andrew Patton, and I'm very happy today to be hosting a special edition of the Society for Financial Econometrics seminar series. Today, we're having presentations from four uh, job market candidates working in topics broadly related to financial econometrics. Our four speakers today will be John Luca Denard from University of Zurich, Philippe Goulet Coulomb from University of Pennsylvania, Ha Yun Jung from New York University, and Mary Lee from University of Cambridge. I think the four topics are all very different and all very interesting. I think it's going to be a great portfolio of presentations today. Our third speaker today is Hayun Jung from New York University Stern School of Business. Hayun, if you'd like to unmute and share your screen, you can begin. Uh, sure, thank you. Let me share my screen. Sorry, there's a little delay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this seminar. I'm excited to present my work on the real consequences of macroprudential regulations. Managing volatile capital flow is a major concern in EM economies. Therefore, FX-related macroprudential policies have been widely used in EM economies. So as of 2018, there were 74 out of about 100 EM economies that were using macroprudential FX regulations in the form of limiting FX exposures, FX position funding, and currency mismatches. However, the real effects of these measures are unclear. So in my paper, I examine the real effects of FX-related macroprudential regulations that limit the risk taking of financial intermediaries. I exploit a natural experiment in South Korea. So Korea started a regulation that limits bank's ratio of FX derivative position to capital in 2010. At the imposition of this regulation, only a fraction of banks in Korea was limited, constrained by this regulation. So I used that cross-bank variation in the tightness of the regulation, and I used bank-level data that can be traced through firms. And I find that, first, the regulation caused a sudden reduction in the supply of FX derivatives, and the reduction in the supply of hedging instrument resulted in a substantial decline in firm exports. So let me explain why the regulation was introduced and what the goal of the regulation was. So this is the plot of gross foreign capital inflows of Korea. Until about 2005, there was a stable capital inflows and there was a surge in capital inflows right before the crisis and it reversed dramatically during the crisis. And if we look into the components, the most volatile part is this purple, which is banks' cross-border borrowings. So the question is, why was there a surge in capital inflows through this banking sector's cross-border borrowings? The answer is related to the exporters' hedging demand. So let me explain the hedging channel with an example. So imagine that this firm is Samsung Shipbuilding Company. During 2005 and 6, on the back of high global demand, Samsung received large shipbuilding orders invoiced in US dollars, which means that Samsung has future dollar cash inflows. So Samsung is long dollar. So to hedge that dollar exposure, they entered into FX derivatives contracts. They sold a large amount of dollar forwards to the banks. So banks became long in dollar and banks hedged this dollar, long dollar position with short term cross border borrowing. So two questions arise. First, why did they hedge the derivatives with the borrowing? And the second question is why did they hedge short term while the derivatives with, were the long term? So the answer to the first question is because, uh, because there was a huge imbalance in the hedging demand. There was no offsetting demand from the importers, for instance. So they needed to um, 
hedge with the synthetic forwards, which involves borrowing um, dollars from borrowing dollars. And why did they hedge in the short term, taking the maturity mismatch? The answer is because it was profitable to do so, which, su which suggests that there was a risk premium associated with this taking the maturity risk. And the way of banks hedging became a huge problem uh, when the financial crisis hit and the banks were not able to roll over this short-term debt. So Korea suffered from FX funding crisis and suffered from um, the currency crisis. So the bottom line is that the exporters hedging demand increased banks FX derivatives positions, which in turn increased banks cross-border borrowings. So because the um, ca capital inflow through the banking sector was directly related to the bank's FX derivatives position, regulator introduced this FX derivatives capital requirement. So the idea is that if banks want to hold large amount of FX derivative position, then they need to raise more capital. This was first announced in June 2010. And the FX derivative position is the monthly average of daily net aggregate delta adjusted notional value of all FX derivatives contracts across all currencies and across all types of derivatives. And the capital is defined as the sum of tier one and tier two capital. Regulators adjusted the regulation multiple times. So what you see here is the plot of minimum requirement. Um, dotted line is the domestic banks and solid line is the foreign banks. And because the regulation I plotted in terms of minimum requirement, here higher number means tighter regulation. So the first three adjustments were the tightening adjustments and the last one was the loosening one. If we um, look at the side-by-side -side graph of the aggregate FX derivatives position, you can see that after each tightening regulation, we see a drop in the aggregate FX derivative position of banks. And the last one was the loosening one, so we don't see much of an effect there. So that this aggregate level analysis does not provide the uh, causal evidence and my identification strategy comes from the heterogeneity in the tightness of the regulation. So what you see on the left hand side is the histogram of FX derivative position to capital. Um, at the imposition of the regulation, the cap was 2.5. So I classify these banks above the line as the constrained banks and these banks below the line as unconstrained banks. And the right hand side, you can see that after the regulation, all banks except this one reduced their ratio below the cap. So I use this cross bank heterogeneity in the tightness of the regulation throughout my empirical analysis. So this is the summary of my data. I use uh, bank level data for 46 banks, which covers all banks that were operating in Korea as of 2008. Um, but the sample period is until 2018. And then I hand collected data on the details of FX derivatives contracts of all listed firms with FX derivatives for 2009 and 10 from the um, Korea's 10K filings. And I use um, FX derivatives hedging, exports, and balance sheet data at the firm level. Okay. So I start from the bank level analysis. So this is the plot of FX derivative position of constrained banks in solid line and unconstrained banks in dotted line. You can see that they were moving roughly parallel in parallel before the imposition of the regulation. And then the constrained banks position fell and remained low relative to the unconstrained banks position. 
um, formally, I test this idea in different depth specification. So we want to understand whether uh, the constrained banks reduce their FX derivative position or raise their capital to manage the ratio. So that's why the outcome variable is either bank's FX derivative position or the capital in logs. And constrained is one if the bank was constrained at the imposition of the regulation. And this regulation T captures um, the overall, the time variation in the overall tightness of the regulation. So the beta three is the coefficient of interest and we expect this to be negative for the FX derivative position because constrained banks are expected to cut down their FX derivative position as the regulation gets tighter. And beta three is expected to be positive for the capital. And here are the results. Uh, the first two columns are when the outcome variable is the derivative position. And the last two columns are when the outcome variable is the capital. And the second column and the fourth column adds the bank fixed effect to control for the time invariant differences in their characteristics across the banks. So you can see that the um, coefficients are negative and significant for the derivative position. In terms of magnitude, uh, these correspond to about 70% reduction in the derivatives position. And um, we don't see much um, going on in the capital side, which suggests that the regulation caused banks to reduce the derivatives position, but they didn't induce banks to raise more capital. So we just confirmed that um, this regulation caused banks to reduce the derivatives, but we don't know whether this is really coming from the supply side or the demand side. So that's my third, uh, sorry, sorry, second um, analysis, which is the contract level analysis. So here the idea is that after controlling for the hedging demand through the firm controls, um, whether the contracts with the constrained banks were reduced compared to the contracts with the constrained banks. So identification assumption is that the change in hedging demand is uncorrelated with the regulation shock, conditional on the, the observables. So the outcome variable is change in effects derivatives scaled by assets, the changes between 2009 and 10. And constraint is one if the contract was with constrained bank. And I have, um, I include bank controls and contract controls as well to make sure that the results are not driven by the differences in the characteristics. Okay, so here the coefficient um, beta is expected to be positive because this is in terms of firm's position. So constrained banks will reduce their long position, which means that firm's position would be, would move from negative to less negative. That's why the beta is expected to be positive. And here are the results. The first two columns are exporters contract. And the, sec the, the next two columns are non-exporters contracts. And the last are the full sample. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can see that the betas are all positive and the effects are strong for the exporters contracts. So this 3.7% um, is translated into 47% reduction in hedging, given that the pre-shock um, mean of the position was negative 8%. Um, and then the last question is whether firms were able to switch the banking relationships. Um, in, other word, in other words, were they able to um, substitute the constrained banks with unconstrained banks? So um, I regress firms total FX derivatives position on the firms exposure to the regulation shock transmitted by the banks. And the results are, again, the coefficients are positive 
um, across all specifications and uh, the effects are strong for exporters. The magnitude um, is about 26% reduction at the firm level. Given that the results were strong for the exporters, um, in other words, exporters were not able to offset the regulation shock transmitted by the banks. Now I constrain my sample to exporters. And I hypothesize that if the firms were um, more exposed by the regulation and if the firms were relying more on the FX derivatives hedging, then the effect, the negative effect on the exports would be larger. So um, that's why I include the full interaction of exposure and high hedge. So high hedge is one, if the firm was hedging more than 10% of their exports. So based on this classification, about 75% of the firms are high hedge firms and the rest are low hedge firms. And the choice of 10% is not um, important. If I replace a uh, high hedge with the ex export um, hedge ratio, then the results are stronger. The reason why I'm bifurcating is because um, I want to um, uh, ensure that the results are not driven by the outliers in the export, uh, export hedge ratio. So, um, I expect this beta EH to be negative because if firms are more exposed and if they were relying a lot by a lot on the FX derivatives hedging, then the effect on the export is expected to be um, negative. And as you can see from here, it's negative and significant. So the magnitude is that for one standard deviation increase in firms exposure, export falls by 17% and rises by 5 or 6%. So the differential effect is 23%, which is substantial. And the last two columns suggest that, um, again, this, these confirm that um, the high hedge firms were um, affected. High hedge firms shifted up their FX derivatives position. So to conclude, um, I study the effects of macroprudential regulations. I find that the regulation caused a sudden reduction in the supply of FX derivatives, which in turn resulted in a substantial decline in firm exports. Um, these are important um, results because first, this suggests that the FX macroprudential regulations can cause unintended consequence of inducing firms to reduce exports. And this potentially has negative effect on the trade balance as well, because the regulation affected negatively on the exporters, but it didn't affect the importers. And this concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Hei. Great. So we've got a few minutes uh, for, for questions. Let me start off with with one. So I thought it was very interesting to see this this pass through of the regulation to uh, through the derivative contract into to exports. That's very interesting. I was curious though, uh, is there much of a uh, much activity from hedge funds in the foreign exchange derivatives market in Korea? Like, where's the Gordon Gecko of Seoul sort of scooping up profits and taking the other side of this the trades that the exporters would would like to do? Um, so. That's a great question. Um, and the hedge fund is a very um, small sector in Korea. So um, they are um, subject to very um, tight regulations. So they are, they are not a main player in the FX derivatives market. And um, the question is why did the um, US hedge fund didn't come in and take this opportunity. And my guess is that um, they, uh, there's a information friction. So they need to, you know, um, go through the, um, the um, know your client kind of process to make sure that they don't default. And yeah, so I think that's what's happening. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess that means that um, extrapolating your results to other countries or other environments would be best where there's a sort of limited activity from speculators or hedge funds 
yeah, they, yeah that's, that's a good point, yeah. Okay. Let me see if there are any questions in the Q&A. So I had a question from uh, Joel, so let me unmute. Uh, I can so we can hear some other people's voice. Uh, Joel, if you'd like to ask your question. I can't hear anything. Me either. I thought that was just me. Okay. Um, no, I think Joel just wrote in the, the chat that he has oh. no mic. Ah, there we go. Thank you for that. Really great. Let but me read it out. back. Yeah, yours is back, so there we go, it's all. Uh, Joel, so Joel asks, uh, can you say how you dealt with the idea that the results may be driven by a lack of capital driving the banks to increase their exposure? Um, sorry, so the question is why? Actually, you can probably read this since you're a official oh. panelist here, you can read this in the Q&A. Uh, can you say okay, I'm not saying it clearly. And I should say to others, I don't know Joel's last name yet, so this is not uh, some inside track. Um, <laughs> results may be driven by lack of capital, driving the banks to increase their exposures. Um, Lack of capital. So do you mean, so I need a little <laughs> clarification. So do you mean why um, banks were not able to increase the capital or? So the reason why the, they um, were not able to raise the capital in the short term was because of the um, frictions. Banks typically um, find it hard to raise um, capitals um, in, a, in the short term. That's why I think um, we are seeing that uh, banks manage it, uh, the ratio by cutting down the derivatives rather than increasing the capital because that's, that's less costly to do so. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Ayun. That was great. Thank you. Okay, now let me change my background one last time. Okay, hey, you great. 